Welcome back. Well, you've watched my last video and you've assessed it and all the risks and hazards, and you've decided that you want to do some bullet casting. Well, good for you. It's a lot of fun. It's a great hobby, and uh, it certainly adds to the sport and the enjoyment of shooting. Of course, it does take some equipment. Now, how much equipment does it take? Well, to be very honest with you, uh, for, the, for the cost of one simple two-cavity mold, uh, you can pretty much get into business. It just, that's just about as simple as it gets. You know, you don't have to have an expensive uh, furnace to melt lead. You can, you can melt lead over a simple, uh, a simple burner uh, outdoors, and uh, you can have a cast iron pot that you pick up at a local yard sale or something like that, and you can start pouring lead. But you're probably going to want to have a little bit uh, more equipment to make life easier and uh, it, it simplifies the process, it makes it more fun and uh, it certainly it certainly takes a lot of the work out of it. So let's talk about what you really need to have. Well I mentioned the mold. Mold is essential because that's that, that's of course what produces the bullet. Um, there's a certain there, there's a certain uh, just as in all things there's a certain snobbishness that sometimes creeps into uh, bullet casting just as it does in everything. Um, you can get some extremely good bullets out of very inexpensive molds. Um, before somebody, you know, waxes snobbishly and produces ears, unless you're driving a Bentley and somebody is carrying your gun afield for you, Please don't bother with the ears because uh, ears and bullet molds just don't mix. Uh, they're, you know, bullet molds are what they are. They're just a bullet mold. Um, there's been some fabulous uh, bullet, make, bullet mold makers in the past. Hensley and Gibbs is a company that went out of business in 1999. They produced some of the finest, most uh, hand-crafted molds ever made. Uh, they, were, they, have, they have a certain legend and mystique attached to them. And the reason for that was because in, in its day, they, you know, back in the 30s when, when they were in their heyday, they were producing molds that were putting out bullets that had uh, correctness to uh, within one, one grain per bullet. That sounds pretty good, and it is very good. Can you get that sort of accuracy with an inexpensive mold? Absolutely. And that's, that's, where, that's where the mystique can melt away a little bit. Uh, Hensley and Gibbs is a great bullet mold maker, and you can still find their you can still find their molds online. Uh, remember that they went out of business over 20 years ago, so whatever you find is either going to be uh, if, if you're lucky to find something was never used, you're in great you're in great fortune. Uh, most of them are going to be used. You got to be very careful about that, and I'll talk about those issues in a little while. Um, they're very expensive. You're buying, basically, you're buying something that's never being made again. And uh, there, there's a company that purchased their, you know, purchased their line of equipment, and they're, and they're, making, they're making bullet molds. But remember that you, you, can't, you can't purchase skill. You can purchase their equipment, but you can't purchase the, the laborers and the skill behind those uh, machines. Then as you work down the line, you can get into Seiko molds, S-A-E-C-O, Seiko molds are another uh, very legendary uh, name in the bullet mold making companies. Uh, and they make a very expensive mold too. They're, now these are iron molds. These are, these are uh, steel products that uh, will last forever if they're properly cared for. Very expensive. When I say very expensive, we're talking upwards of $250 per, per mold. Um, or more, and uh, they're, they're sometimes very difficult to get a hold of. You know, their supply runs short very quickly, and they're, they're in limited production. So those, those molds really are difficult to find if you're willing to spend that kind of money. Lyman has been, uh, you know, they've been a mold maker for many, many years. They've been making molds for well over 100 years. Perhaps back into the 1800s, they were making molds uh, under the uh, ideal name. <clears throat> They're certainly a great mold maker and very skilled uh, craftsmen that turn them out and uh, nothing, nothing bad can ever be said about a Lyman mold. RCBS has been making molds for quite a number of years now and they make molds along the same uh, quality. 
Um, again, we're talking pretty much in the same price range between Lee and RCBS mold. Both of them are pretty well available uh, through common resources, you know, online and, you know, it, at uh, gun shops who uh, specialize in those things. Then finally, you can get into Lee molds. Now, the what I'm talking about here is a price drop from, uh, basically, you can buy a six, a six cavity mold like this one here, production mold. Most, most other mold companies, in fact, I don't know of any mold company that makes more than a four uh, cavity mold. This is a, uh, this is a six cavity Lee mold. Um, I've cast hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, bullets with this one. This one hap happens to be a uh, three, I'm sorry, this is not the one that, this is not the one that has cast hundreds. This is a 358 diameter. My, the ones that I've cast hundreds of uh, bullets with of my 45 and uh, let's see if I can grab that one. This is my 45 mold and uh, it's without the handles right now. The, the handles are easily uh, taken off and can be uh, placed on a different mold. But this this particular set, this mold right here, uh, has been turning out fantastic uh, truncated cone uh, flat point 45 caliber bullets. Uh, these are uh, 230 grain round nose. As you can see, I, I marked my handle so that I can readily identify them on the shelf. Uh, be, be careful you don't mark your, your uh, casting handle that you're going to swap from one mold to another because that's going to be married to it forever unless you sand it off and refinish it. But uh, these do last for a long, long time. Now these are, these are aluminum molds. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Lee molds because I have them right here. Uh, and that's what I have been preferring uh, over the last number of years. Um, I did a bunch of, uh, I did a bunch of casting with uh, Lyman molds and they were great molds, but you know, they were limited to two bullet cavities. Um, there were issues with trying to keep them uh, from rusting, you know, keeping them in an envir environment like a, a basement. And it, where I lived previously, uh, it was damper than this. This is a dry basement. But I, I lived in a, in a house that had a fairly damp basement, and it was very difficult to keep uh, those molds uh, clean and protect them from uh, corrosion. And whatever anti-corrosion products you use on them, you have to degrease them before you use the mold. Uh, otherwise, you know, you, you, you'll have to cast, you'll have to cast a quite a number of bullets before it burns off that lubricant. Aluminum molds are, they're absolutely great. I love them. Uh, aluminum molds, first of all, uh, they're much, much lighter. Um, I'm not going to handle that one too much because it doesn't have a handle to hold it together. And if it drops one side of it on the floor, then I'm, in, I'm cooked. Um, these molds are much lighter, naturally being aluminum. There's a fatigue factor involved, you know, with, with handling these molds uh, over a long period of time. And, and I told you, don't, don't sit there for, for hours and hours casting because uh, you, you're going get, to get sick eventually. Um, and you can get also get, you know, repetitive motion disease. And then you then you end up with, you know, carpal tunnel syndrome and things like that. So all those issues, you know, you got to be careful because you, you basically, you can get into a production mentality um, and, and it, it basically exceeds the uh, fun level. But the nice, the nice things about aluminum molds are many, I think. First of all, being light, it, they're nice to work with. This, this six cavity mold, the reason why they can make a six cavity mold and sell it is because you can lift it up and you can, you can work with it uh, for a period of time without it causing uh, fatigue. The other thing is that they heat up very quickly. Uh, this mold here, uh, to, to heat it up, you can, you can set it atop, straddle it across the top of your furnace to warm it up as the, as the furnace is warming it up, uh, warming up the lead uh, and getting it up to temperature. You can actually dip the corner of this mold down into the lead. You know when that mold is, when that mold is hot enough, when the lead no longer sticks to the uh, aluminum, when it, when it just falls away. Then you know you've got a pr pretty close to working temperature. Um, they're also, uh, they're, they're also beautifully machined. Now, I can, I, can take, I can take six bullets out of this mold, out of any of my six cavity molds, and 
measure every single one of them, and they're all going to measure within a half a ten thousandths, uh, uh, a half a thousandths rather, of uh, one another. So, you know, this, this particular mold here, 358, I just, I just measured up so I could speak with authority on this. I just measured up a bunch of these 358 diameter, 200 grain bullets. Now, when I say 358, that's nominal because that's, that's, what, that's the diameter you want, you want to have to shoot out of a, a 35 caliber rifle like a, you know, like a 35 Remington because you want to resize those down one thousandth of an inch in order to uniformly make them to 358. So those are, they're nominally, it's a nominally a 358 die, it produces bullets that are 359. So one thousandths greater, which you put through your bullet sizing die, and that uniformly sizes them all to be exactly the same. But these are so close that, these are so close that you, you really don't need to size them. Um, these, these would be one thousandths over, and uh, with, with lubricant on them, you'd have no problem firing these, these uh, bullets whatsoever. They, they, they come out 359 to 359 and a half. That's how close they come out every single time. And, uh, you know, that's the variation. There's a half a thousandth variation only uh, in, in each of these uh, cavities. And that means that they are 359. So that's, that's a fabulously... Um, consistent level. The other thing I did too was, uh, I'll dig out the numbers here, <clears throat> I wrote down the, uh, I took 14 bullets at random, I just stuck my hand in there and I grabbed 14 bullets and um, what I did was I calculated, I, I, I took note of all the different uh, all the different uh, weights that that uh, mold produced at random. Just they all they all just came out of the bucket, and they varied only by six tenths of a grain. Six tenths of a grain. That's that's within one grain. Remember what I said about the Hensley and Gibbs bowls? They were famous for producing bullets which came out within a grain of each other with their four cavity molds. Well, this comes within less than that. It comes up within six tenths of a grain. The base, the bases of these bullets are extraordinarily uh, crisp. They've got a small sprue on them. The sprue is, we'll talk about that. That's the that's the remainder of the lead when you're, when you're pouring that. Uh, it puddles up on top of the sprue cutter and then the sprue cutter cuts that off. So that little, that little mark in the middle of the base of the bullet is where the sprue once lived. And um, that, that particular, that particular uh, bullet right there can be used with a gas check and we'll talk about those too. Uh, because this is a, this is a bullet that could be driven to a higher velocity than you'd want to have for uh, exposure to the the uh, hot gases. So that's a little bit about uh, molds. You can get two cavity molds. This two cavity mold, you'd be surprised how fast you can move along with two cavity molds because there's something about it that's so light that you you can work quickly. You know, so even though it's it, it's really not it's really not one third the speed of a six cavity mold is probably more like half the speed because you can you can move you can move along uh, you can you can cast very quickly with a two cavity mold. One other thing I want to bring up you'll notice that this this little widget right here this is a simple uh, wooden dowel you use that to whack the whack that sprue cutter and that's what that's what cuts that sprue off that hot lead uh, because it's still very very hot when it's in that mold that mold gets extremely hot it reaches temperatures exceeding 500 degrees so and when you're talking with lead that's uh, well over 700 degrees so that's that's how you knock that sprue off is with this with this mallet here the dowel and don't ever use a hammer or anything else. just use a dowel that's the thing to use um, the nice thing about the Lee six cavity mold, which I really appreciate, is that it has this it has this handle right here, and that has a cam, and that cam just knocks that sprue, that entire sprue, it just slices it right off effortlessly. It's a fantastic, 
fantastic system. You know, as in all things, Lee has, and I don't get a thing from Lee. Um, you know, for all the for all the honorable mentions I've given to him, I, I don't I don't get a thing from him. Uh, but I appreciate their engineering. They're they're uh, extraordinary in their in their thoughtfulness of how they do things. These handles, they're they're thoughtful enough that these handles will fit other people's molds. Now, I don't know about all of them, but uh, these handles will fit uh, other, other different manufacturers' molds, which is kind of clever because that means that they can sell, you know, when people break their handles uh, for their other molds, they can sell them these handles for $20. So they're very inexpensive handles. They're very, very strong. Uh, they're not second grade handles by any means. These are very, very strong industrial quality handles. The sprue cutter here is, it's a, it's a blued steel, uh, works effortlessly. The, uh, the molds themselves are beautifully, beautifully uh, engineered and uh, beautifully cut. They cut that with what's called a cherry. And um, it's quite a process involved. Uh, the other thing I like about uh, aluminum molds is naturally that uh, you don't have to worry about corrosion. Um, they, uh, and what you see on that, that, that amber, that amber color, that's residue from beeswax. Uh, I lubricate my molds with beeswax. It, it makes a, it makes a messy appearance of them. Um, I know that there are, there are casters out there online who don't do anything with the molds, but I follow Lee's recommendation. They're the people who make these and they know better, uh, than anybody else, uh, what it's what's necessary to keep these ticking for a long time. This particular mold here, this uh, 45 mold, I've been using. I've been using that for. I've been using that for a long, long time. I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of bullets I've made with that. But that's that's a mold that uh, hasn't even. It, it shows no signs of wear whatsoever. Uh, you can see it's. I I also. You know, I'll, I'll talk about how to uh, prepare molds a little bit later. But don't be afraid of aluminum molds. I think they're, they're gaining great popularity. Uh, there was, like I say, there was a snob factor involved with a lot of casters for a long time, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't hear of uh, such a thing as a, as a mold. These molds cost, uh, you can get them for less than $50 for a set of, you know, for one of these six, six cavity molds. And then with the handle, you can you can you can splurge and get a handle for each one of the molds. Uh, but there's only two screws involved. You just take out the two screws and put your new put your handle back on there. So uh, for, for basically for and the handle, as I say, is twenty dollars. So for for fifty dollars, you can get a six cavity mold. Um, the two cavity molds come. The two ca this one here, I haven't I haven't uh, I haven't done anything with it yet. I'm gonna. I'll use this one to uh, demonstrate how to uh, prepare a mold. This one happens to be my uh, 309 cavity, uh, 309 diameter, uh, 120 grain carbine bullet mold. So you can use this for any for any 308 diameter uh, bore, but uh, it's specifically for the um, 30 carbine. It has a it has a bullet that will feed nicely. Uh, over the years, they've changed the um, they've changed the design a little bit. You can see this one here has centering pins. You can see the you see the centering pins right here um, that are laying horizontal. They worked fine. Uh, that was what that's what uh, they used for many years. And in these, you can see they they went more to the traditional uh, the traditional conical pins that uh, male and female recesses. So. Uh, they've just changed that design slightly. They work the same. I've got I've got molds of both kinds that I've been using for a number of uh, years, and they they work they work identically. So, so that's that. Um, I think it's uh, it's probably something they did to uh, speed production. It might be a little easier to engineer. I don't know. Um, but we'll talk more about the molds, but that's, that's the story with the molds. You can buy those molds, I think, for less than 20, I think it's about $25 or so for a two-cavity mold, which includes the handles. That's a, that's a real bargain. 
and they work just as well as the six cavity mold. I think the six cavity mold is the way to go for me. For most people, they'll find that, you know, for just another $25, you've got a mold that, that does three times as much work. Uh, they heat up quicker because there's more mass involved. There's, you know, the, the aluminum is heavier. Um, by the same token, they, they, don't, they don't tend to overrun. They don't tend to uh, overheat like the smaller, the smaller molds sometimes will get uh, pretty hot on you. So what you have to do is you have to just rest them for a moment on a uh, wet towel to, uh, to cool them down. So that's the mold. Now, you need to have something to lubricate molds. Uh, again, this is, something which, this is something which is very inexpensive. Um, you need to have some beeswax. You can, you can buy beeswax in any candle maker shop. Don't use, don't use candle wax. Candle wax contains mostly paraffin, and paraffin is a petroleum substance, and a petroleum substance will ruin those, those molds. I know there are casters out there who will disagree, but if Lee says that it's going to wreck their molds, Lee knows it'll wreck their molds. So don't, you know, I, I like to stick with the book when it comes to that stuff. They make them, they engineered them, they've, they, they probably used them more than anybody else. Uh, you know, they have people who work with them that, that are, you know, members of their family and they're in, in their industry and they use them so they know what works. And then next, of course, most people are going to want a lead furnace. Um, a lead furnace is something that you can spend as, as little as probably $35, $40 on. Again, you can do it on top of a uh, electric burner, you know, outside with a, with a, uh, just a plain cast iron pot. Don't use aluminum or anything like that. You need to have something which got some density to it so it doesn't fall off the, fall off the burner and, and cause a real serious issue with burns. Uh, like, I, like I said before, lead is nothing to be trifled with. You have to respect its, uh, it, its heat and its ability to burn as well as its, uh, you know, the, the hazards I spoke of in my last video. So, but a good furnace uh, is, is important. It, it makes life easier. It'll maintain temperature much easier. Um, this one here happens to be the uh, Lee Pro 4, uh, 420. Um, the, the 20 means that it's a 20 pounder. So nominally this will hold 20 pounds of uh, lead. It's, uh, it, it's a great it's a great pot. I've been using this one for a number of years now, and um, it, it just works flawlessly. I, I've never had a problem with it. It, uh, it takes about 30 minutes, 35 minutes to uh, fully heat uh, and bring the, bring the lead to a, you know, working state. Uh, it'll melt a lot sooner than that, but you want to get the temperature up to about 750, 780 degrees in order to get some good bu bullets going. And, you know, you can also, you don't have to worry about, again, some of the snobbishness comes in. You know, people are proud of their shiny bullets that don't have any frost in them and stuff like that. Well, those are, those are great. You know, there's they're something to be proud of. But, you know, I don't, I don't put my bullets up at a, you know, uh, at a uh, con county fair or anything for, uh, you know, blue ribbon. So I shoot them, that's all. And uh, frosty bullets actually... Uh, work better because the, the Lee lubrication tends to stick better and, is, and adhere uh, more uniformly with the frosted bullets than it does with a very shiny, pretty bullet. Pretty doesn't mean a thing to me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pragmatist, I'm practical, I just want to have bullets that uh, give me some shooting pleasure. So getting back to the furnace, this one here has a, uh, it, it has a, a rheostat dial that you can uh, dial down the temperature or, or turn it up if necessary. Um, turning down is, tends to be the thing you need to do because the, the, the lead will tend to, you know, ride. It will tend to rise up in, in temperature because what you're doing is you're working with the same size heating element, but at the same time, the density of the lead is dropping, so it's heating up more readily, more quickly, and it tends to overrun and get a little bit hotter. So another good thing to have is a lead thermometer. Now you can get an analog lead thermometer, one that just simply has a, a rotating dial that uh, it looks like a meat thermometer that you, you put in the lead. Those work great. Uh, believe it or not, for less money, uh, you can get one of these Lyman uh, molds that has the thermistor that goes in, and this will maintain a constant uh, 
readout of your temperature as you go along. So when you see that, when you see that temperature rising uh, beyond your desired point, or if it's dropping below your desired point, you can immediately uh, turn this on. And you, you can, when you turn that dial, you can hear the element uh, humming a little bit. So you know that you've, your, your thermostat has hit the point where it's heating up again. So you can, you can monitor it also by, by ear. So if it's turning on too much, you can, you can just knock it down a half a notch or so. So that's a good combination to have. Now you can, you, this, this particular pot, I, I think it runs for less than $75. I'm not sure of the price. You can check all these things out. And as time goes on, this, this video is going to uh, negate that anyway because this is going to, uh, prices are always going to increase with our inflation. Um, this one has a, a bottom pour spout. I really recommend a bottom pour spout because as you're working, that that mold sits right underneath. And uh, I'll show you this as, as we go along when we start to actually cast bullets. But it sits on the uh, guide, and you just you just ride that back as you lift up your handle, and it fills those bullet holes, and uh, it creates a it creates a continuous sprue along the top. And you wait about eight or ten seconds for that for that sprue to harden. You can watch it harden right before your eyes. You can see it change from being a glossy uh, liquid to being uh, a, a, a frosty looking solid. Then you just knock your sprue off, open up your handle over a bucket of water or, on, or onto a, a towel, uh, and they'll just drop right out. So it's, it's, a very, it's a very nice thing to have a bottom pour spout. The alternative is to have the old ladle. Now you have to have a ladle anyway because you're going to you're going to want to uh, do do your fluxing. We'll talk about fluxing when we talk about uh, making your bullets. But you need to have a you need to have a, a ladle so you can stir your lead and to uh, incorporate the alloys together and to remove your dross from the top of the pot. But that's the other reason why I really like to have a bottom pour spout is because any dross that's on the top, you really don't even have to remove the dross as long as you're always drawing off from the bottom and you never let that dross drop down into the uh, pouring spout. The, the dross is, you know, other, other elements might be some iron, uh, copper, it could be paper, it could be anything that happens, rubber, anything that happens to be in there, you'll take it out with that. Now, I, I really recommend that before you before you bring lead into a house is that you cast it into pure ingots. So it's a good thing to have a uh, ingot mold. Where's my ingot mold? Where'd it go? Somebody hit it. Here it is. You can get these from, you can get these from Lyman or from Lee. Uh, Lee has them so that they're uh, one pounders and half pounders, which is kind of nice because um, sometimes you don't want to, you don't have enough room to put it in a, a, a full, you know, a, a full pound. So, you know, it's nice to just have the half pounders that you can break off. All you have to do is, uh, all you have to do is just put these in a vise and just bend them off and they'll, they'll break. Or you don't necessarily have to fill them all the way to the top. I tend to fill them all right to the top and it produces one solid ingot. Um, it's probably a little heavier than a pound and, and half a pound. But um, so that's, that's what you really should have is a uh, ingot mold. This is a process that you do always outdoors because if you're, if you're working with, you know, scavenged lead, especially if you're working with lead that you've uh, acquired from a, a, a tire shop, you're going to have all kinds of junk in there. There's going to be grease in that uh, bucket. There's going to be uh, tire stems, rubber. Uh, all kinds of noxious materials. That stuff you want to put in a big cast iron pot, uh, you know, out, outdoors on a breezy day. You don't want to be anywhere near it. You know, let that thing melt down by itself. Use a long, long handled spoon. Stir that stuff up and get the, get the dross off the top. Skim it off and uh, you, you want to uh, get rid of it. Now, I'll talk about that because that also requires fluxing. If you don't flux it, you're going to lose all your tin that's in that uh, metal. Uh, so I'll talk about the fluxing process when we get into that part of it. But that's, a, that's an essential item. You really want to have, uh, you know, an ingot mold. Unless you're going to be working strictly with, uh, you know, with purchased pre-manufactured lead alloys, 
that's something that you can do. Uh, it raises the cost a little bit, and a lot of people now are being forced to do that simply because uh, the availability of uh, the, the old, the oldest availability, the most traditional way, was to simply get wheel weights at the tire shops. But those are becoming uh, m less, uh, less suitable because of the uh, use of z wide use of zinc now uh, by manufacturers to make uh, wheel weights. And you cannot use zinc at all unless you have an iron cast mold. Uh, and, and zinc is really not, it doesn't have the same density, so you don't get the same weight in a, in a bullet. And uh, it's, you can never use that as an alloy. You can't incorporate zinc into your bullets. Zinc tends to float to the surface because it has a, a higher uh, melting temperature, which is a very, very useful thing. You, you, everything, everything that's not lead and lead alloy will float to the top. Um, and by fluxing, and I'm going to digress for a moment, uh, by fluxing you, you drop in some beeswax or some people use, uh, you know, wood shavings and you, you stir that into the pot aggressively bringing air down into the pot with your, with your big ladle very carefully wearing welding gloves and what that does is the fluxing does two things. It first of all incorporates the useful alloys, the tin. It incorporates that into the lead and uh, the antimony and all the things that are necessary for, for bullet hardness. And uh, the other thing that it does is it allows, the, it brings the dross to the top, all the undesirable things that come to the top. So you'll see everything come up. You'll see, you know, you'll see all the little metal clips that come off your wheel weights. You'll see all the, you know, tire, the rubber tire stems pop to the top, the brass, all those parts, and you'll also see all the zinc alloy wheel weights pop to the top. Don't let that lead get hotter than about 650, 670 degrees because if you get it too hot, that zinc will start to melt and then you've ruined your entire batch. You do not want to let zinc incorporate itself into that lead because once it does, it becomes part of the, part of the mixture and you have to basically dispose of it. You won't get good bullets. So, as I say, I digress. What do you need besides the pot the, uh, and the uh, bullet molds? Well, it's not essential, but you should have uh, a, sizing, a sizing die. Um, this is a, uh, it says sizing lubricating uh, die. It really is not a lubricating die, it's a sizing die. That's all this die does. It's a very, very simple process. Years ago, you know, we used to use, um, you know, like a Lyman sizing system, and the bullet was inserted, uh, and there was a there was a heated element that uh, injected uh, lubricant into the die, and it it filled the uh, grooves up along the side of the uh, along the side of the uh, bullet, and you ended up with a shiny bullet. Uh, that uh, a shiny bullet with with uh, blue or pink uh, grooves. You can see right here. This is a simple die. It's very much like a regular die body. It screws right into the top of your regular loading press. I got a small uh, in my in my uh, loading room. I've showed it to you before. I have a uh, preparation area and I have a small, inexpensive uh, Lee press. Uh, I don't use the lead press for anything except for just uh, doing bullet sizing and for knocking out uh, spent primers, things like that that I need to do. And there's a there's a plug, a plunger that this this goes simply right into the top of your uh, press ram, and that pushes that pushes a bullet straight up in. Uh, you you rest the you rest the bullet right on it like that, and press it right up into the uh, die and they spur it out the top and you can see right here they they spur it out the top and they just captured very neatly in this container don't let that container get too full because all of a sudden the top will pop off and you'll have bullets all over the floor but this will this this contains them as they pop out uh, one by one and it's as fast as you can as fast as you can work you you're pumping bullets through this. I prefer to have my bullets lubricated ahead of time. Put one coat of, a, a light coat of lube. Well, what I do is I, I mix up um, an 80% 80 
80 percent uh, mineral spirits, not mineral oil, but 80 percent mineral spirits with 20 percent uh, mixture of this and I keep it in a special bottle and that's what I use to make my first coating and the first coating that way they are I don't get this dye all gummed up and then I use that to uh, run the bullets through the through the dye to size them that sometimes is all you need but what I do afterwards is I, I, I after I've sized them all down then I'll use the regular strength bullet lube and I'll toss them in a bucket this is how it's applied you just simply take a uh, an ice cream bucket and uh, put your lid, put your bullets in there. Squirt a little bit of this on top. Shake it. If you don't see enough amber substance on them, squirt a little bit more on until you see them all evenly coated, and you've got your bullets lubricated. Then all you have to do is spread them out on newspaper and uh, let them dry overnight. It's just it's just such a simple process, and. Uh, you know, you're not going to have shiny bullets when you're done. They, they're going to be they're going to be amber colored, but they're going to be lubricated all over the lead. So you're not going to have the lead abrading down your bore, and causing leading issues. So I think it's a great system. It's it's very inexpensive system, and uh, for me that's the way to go. I, I've divorced myself from all these other these these other methods which go back. They're traditional. They go way back. You know, 150 years or more. But I don't need to go through all that, and, you know, technology is wonderful. Sometimes, you know, people think outside the box and they try something else, and it turns out to be better. You know, that's why we're, that's why we're not driving around in Model Ts anymore. So, now, is there anything else? Well, first of all, make sure you have yourself a good loading manual. Because you need to have loading data which is specific to lead bullets. Uh, loading data which is uh, derived from... Uh, sources uh, elsewhere are uh, generally for uh, for uh, jacketed metal bullets, and jacketed uh, bullets have a different they have a different pressure level as they uh, as they're uh, fired. Uh, so you need to have you need to have data which is uh, directly uh, and specifically for uh, cast bullets. It'll say lead bullets. So for instance, um, I can go right here to. Um, nine millimeter and as you see right here you got nine millimeter lead make sure I'm looking at yeah 124 grain lead bullets right there so that's the sort of that's the sort of data that you want you want data that's specific to uh, lead bullets and then you know exactly what uh, your your data is is doing and and it's not uh, it's taking away the guesswork the other, the other manual um, is this one here, is the uh, Cast Bullet Handbook by Lyman. Uh, again, they've been, they've been doing this for probably longer than anybody else in the business. Uh, and they have, this, this book is just nothing but Cast Bullet loading data for every, for, as far as I can see, it's for every caliber. Um, I mean, if you, wanna, if you wanna make up Cast Bullet for a uh, 35 Remington, or if you want to make them up for 4570, it's in here. All that stuff, 45 Colt, uh, but it also has it also has stuff that uh, the four or five uh, uh, 4070 sharps. But it even has the uh, it even has the modern stuff in it. So if you want to cook up loads for you know one of your modern calibers, uh, they're in here. And uh, it'll give you the load data for them and what powders to use. So it's it's really it's really the best manual out there. If you want to have a, a book that will tell it all, this is the one to have. And they do actually give load data for not all, but a lot of the Lee molds. So um, even if you want to load up a 460 Weatherby Magnum, if you got that sort of uh, interest, you know they have they have the the data here for uh, a Lee cast bullet for that for that uh, rifle. So it's got it all. It's a really nice resource, and I think it's it has a lot of other information. Some of it's proprietary uh, information, which is I think um, you know it's there's a there's a sales there's a sales bent behind it. Um, the tendency to uh, try to sell some of their products, and there's some stuff in there that I don't entirely agree with all when it comes to uh, cleaning and lubricating rifles. But um, 
Aside from that, the load data is great. You need to have, you need to have just a bunch of other uh, essentials. You need to have uh, some good, I, I prefer to just get inexpensive welder's gloves. Uh, they protect your hands from any uh, splashing of lead uh, because you will splash some lead occasionally. Uh, it's, just, it's just inevitable. You're, you're working with a liquid substance and it, it's uh, impossible to avoid uh, having lead uh, spilt on you. So, you know, that's going to protect you from having a serious burn on your hand that uh, will leave a scar. The thermometer I spoke of, uh, and, and as I said in the, in the last video, make sure that uh, you, you get rid of those gloves after two or three sessions, not two or three sessions, you can get probably th three or four sessions, but after that, if they're a long session, uh, you want to get rid of them uh, and toss them, and they're, they're cheap. They're only like three dollars and a half where I buy them, uh, so I, I, usually, I usually buy six pair at a time or something, and I use them until I get a hole in the thumb with, you know, using them for uh, stoking the wood stove. Have yourself a, have yourself a good sponge. Uh, and, and you should have that. Uh, you should have that soaking with. Uh, you could pretty pretty soaked with uh, some fresh water. Have that available because uh, you know that's that's something that you can use to um, clean up any quickly cool down any uh, any spilt lead or something like that. Uh, and if you've got a lead puddle, you can hit that with it, and that'll cool it off immediately. Uh, so that's a good thing to have. And you can also use that. I really recommend after you get done uh, doing all your, your uh, casting is to wipe your bench down and then clean this with some detergent uh, and then use, you can use that to always keep your bench clean so you don't have lead dust. This will pick up your lead dust and uh, just be careful constantly what you're doing with lead. You need to have a, uh, you need to have a trash can to put to put your dross in, so just a, just a plain old tomato can is fine. A big soup can that works for that. And when you're done, after a couple of sessions, you can just get rid of this and dump it. This contains just basically it looks like it looks like ash in the bottom, and that's basically all it is. It's just uh, there's there's uh, whatever whatever corrupt material is in that pot uh, when it's when it's uh, brought up to uh, temperature. And even if you're using even if you're using pure, you know, cast ingots, you're going to get some dross from it because there's always some that doesn't get uh, taken out when you're uh, making your ingots. So uh, always have always have that on hand. And I mentioned beeswax. Get some beeswax. You can buy it. You can buy it sometimes at health food stores and places like that. Do not use paraffin. Paraffin is something that will will completely gum up your uh, uh, your molds. Don't use candles, please. Uh, I prefer to just simply go buy um, plain old beeswax, and you use this. You use just a just a small smidgen, just just like that, a, but the size of a green pea, and that's that's dropped into a pot this size, and then uh, stirred in, and that will bring all your dross to the top, and that will that will mix in your tin. So. Those are some of the essentials. Some of the non-essentials to have. Um, this is to me, this this is to me a dandy gadget. It's not cheap at all. I think this is going somewhere as around sixty-five dollars or more. But this is a lead hardness testing kit. Um, this here works great. It takes a little bit of time to learn, and I'll have a special video on how to use that. Um, but that will that will give you a direct readout of it. it imprints a, a, a ball point into a flattened surface of your bullet. In other words, we'll, we'll show you how that's done. But that imprints a dent, and then the dent is read with a little microscope that's included with this along a scale, and you can see based on the width of that dent, how wide that dent and how, how big that dent is, will tell you exactly what the Brinell hardness of that bullet is. Now, Lee has worked up a pressure uh, system. They know that before it was thought that it was just had to do with velocity. Well, Lee has determined that it's not velocity, it's pressure that causes the leading issue. Uh, they, they know, there's a direct correlation between pressure and, um, and the uh, 
Brinnell hardness. So, and that also, that's consistent with velocity because typically as pressure goes up in a, in a handgun or a rifle, so does the velocity. But it was always presumed to be the velocity, which was the, that was the uh, issue that had to be dealt with. More specifically, it's the pressure, and pressure is something which all good loading data will uh, illustrate across the tables, and that's one of the things that's nice about the uh, Lee and uh, Lyman handbooks is that they'll give you the pressures of not only the high, uh, the high margins, but also the low starting point, so you know exactly what your pressures are. So that's a handy device to have. Expensive, but well worth the investment once you get into it. You don't have to have uh, you don't have to have such a thing uh, for many many years. I was casting lead simply by you know by guessing by gory. You know you'd get a bunch of wheel weights, and you followed the old Lyman number two uh, formula for for making for, for making Lyman number two uh, alloy uh, by mixing a certain amount of tin into it and things like that. But the problem is is that over the years. Uh, lead wheel weights became less specific in what their makeup was. So uh, the alloy tended to drift a little bit uh, softer and harder and you didn't know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, but you can find out your relative hardness by taking two, if you have a bullet that works well, if for one thing, if you're, if you're leading, you have to add more, you have to add more tin or antimony. Now tin only, tin can only harden to a certain Point. Once you get it beyond 3%, 3.5%, you're not going to get any harder with adding tin. What tin does, and, and I'll talk about this more specifically, what tin does is helps fill the mold out and uh, create a more perfect bullet uh, and fills out all the cavities in the mold. Antimony is the thing which really hardens. Now, this super hard is basically, it's, it's antimony, it's a very, very high concentration of antimony, uh, which uh, roto metals has alloyed into uh, a lead bar. It's extremely hard. I mean, to to saw this thing is a bear. Um, I, I I got to the point where I just I just hold it with I just hold it with my gloves <clears throat> into the pot until it melts off. I I have some <laughs> I have some witness marks here sawn into the side. So I just melt it off until it melts down to a, a half or one of those witness marks, and then I know that I've got. Uh, a certain amount for my lead pot to, to harden those bullets. So that's how I do it. Um, what I sometimes have done in the past, and I haven't bothered yet, is I take that and I'll cast, I'll actually cast up a bunch of bullets. You don't have to cast, spe you know, very uh, special bullets. Uh, you just simply cast up a bunch of bullets and put them into a container and you can use those bullets like, you know, like pills. You just, if, you, if you need to bring up your hardness, you can drop one or two place one or two into your molten pot. So that's another way people sometimes add tin or antimony is by making, having, having specially marked uh, containers. You know, that this one contains tin, this one contains antimony. Now that's not 100% antimony, that means that, that that's a percentage, so it's like 50% antimony. And uh, the, reason why, the reason why it's cast into that super hard is because you cannot actually uh, melt antimony unless you bring up the temperature around 1100 degrees, which most furnaces, you don't want to be working your furnace that hard. Um, the other way to uh, determine the relative hardness, if you have a new batch of bullets and you want to see if it's up to the hardness of your, the, the bullets that were working, uh, is you take two, you take your, you take the bullet of known density, mark it with a magic marker so you don't get them mixed up, but uh, take your bullet of known hardness, uh, it, even if it's too soft, you take that one and then your new one and then you put them base to base like this and when you put them base to base then you put the points in between the vice, uh, the vice's jaws of a uh, bench vise and you squeeze them together. The softer bullet will yield and then you'll know which is the harder and which is the softer. So that's, that's it, it doesn't tell you the Brinnell hardness, but it will certainly, it'll certainly tell you which bullet is working the harder or the softer, depending on which way you want to go. So that's how you do that. So we're getting too much into the, um, we're getting too much into the mechanics of it. I wanted to just show you the, um, the essentials. Uh, we've talked about the molds, the handles, uh, what sort of materials you can get. 
Remember, you get the iron molds and you get the aluminum molds. I vastly prefer the aluminum molds simply because they're a lot more cost effective. Uh, they produce fabulous bullets, um, you know, and, and they just work well. I love this. I love this uh, special. Here's Benny. Here's my buddy. Oh, he's got a cookie, too. Mommy must have given you a cookie, huh? He's, he came down to show me his cookie. <laughs> he's a character. So, but I like this system. Uh, it works, and um, they produce beautiful bullets. Um, showed you the uh, various accessories that you have to have. Uh, it's a good thing to have a, a steel tray, uh, and naturally you have to have a. You, you should have a, a, a cotton towel. Don't use anything synthetic around it, uh, lead because it's going to melt. But you need to have a good, uh, you know, cotton dish towel folded up. Uh, you can fold up one or two of those, and you can drop your you can drop your sprue on that. Your sprue needs to be your, your sprue is what is cut off the top of your uh, your bullets. That has to be uh, clipped off, and before you drop your bullets into a, you can either drop them into a bath like I do, or you can drop them onto a different towel. So you drop your sprue onto one uh, towel, drop your bullets onto the other towel, and you and you go right back to business with your with your uh, mold. Uh, so that's all you really have to have. It's a, it's a very simple thing to get into, and as I say, you don't have to have too much equipment. You can do it with just just a simple mold, and you can melt your stuff in a in a in a in an inexpensive cast iron pot. Make sure that it's you know make sure that it sits sturdily and without you know without tipping on your uh, stove. Uh, but you can do it you can do it on a simple uh, plug-in you know two burner stove you know a one burner stove. It's it, it, it's been done that way for many many years by people, and you can ladle them. Uh, ladling them is is it's kind of a chore. Um, it's just a matter of dipping and then pouring them into each each bullet hole and so forth. It, it can be done. It's, uh, it's, it's the way it was done for many years before bottom pour uh, pots came out. But there's a difference in price between a bottom pour, this large bottom pour pot, and their smallest ladling pot uh, is only about thirty-five or forty dollars. It's not. It's not a big deal. And the other pot, I think the smallest one only holds five pounds. So you'll go through five pounds of lead pretty quickly if you're the average caster. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and God bless.